What's good, y'all? Welcome back to another video on this lovely, lovely Tuesday, uh, day after Christmas. Hope you guys had a great Christmas, very, very good Christmas. Like I said, I am a tad bit sick, so I do sound funny where I just start coughing randomly. Please excuse me. I'm going to try not to, like, do too much, but obviously, it's going to be time. It just happened, so that's my, my apologies. Um, if you guys are celebrating Boxing Day, happy Boxing Day to you guys, um, depending on where you guys are. Things about UK and Canada, stuff like that. But um, yeah, if I look hot, if I feel hot, it's, you know, I'm trying to, you know, it's it's just sickness. It's, it's all this. But I did, I did miss you guys. I know it's been like a few days. I hope you guys did catch up with all the content. I know you guys did, most likely. Um, y'all can rent. Obviously, we know about y'all can rent from the video. Obviously, it was a driver that, you know, unfortunately passed away from us at a young age. But uh, shout out to Aiden Millwall. We are finna check it out. We are finna see what's on. As always, don't forget to watch the video. And, and Subscribe as well, man. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate you guys. Uh, as we are wrap, wrapping up the year, I appreciate you guys for the, throughout the whole year, man. Honestly, you guys have been amazing, tremendous. Let's go ahead. Let's head into 2024, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's heading 2024. <coughs> but, let's kick butt. <coughs> let's start. <coughs> sorry, guys. I can't help it. I cannot help it. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to not. I'm trying to not. And the intro is kind of like pale, stuff like that. The one thing that gets you thinking is that had he survived the 1970 Formula 1 season, Jochen Rent would have been 80 years old yesterday. But the thing is, Jochen Rent won the 1970 Formula 1 World Championship. And if you know your Formula 1 history a little bit, you'll know that Jochen Rent is the only person in history to win the World Championship despite being killed during that season. Dang. So with that in mind, let's look at how Formula 1's only posthumous world champion came to be. Now, Rint's racing career got off to a shaky start. A bit of a lad in his youth, he was kicked out of school several times and hey. in his first race in 1961, he was black flagged for dangerous driving. But as time went on, he got better and became- Hey my god, what were you doing in school? You were just BSing, huh? He ain't, he, hey listen, he didn't really care. He wanted just to race. But then you race and you get a black flag. Come on now, how often do we see black flags in? <laughs> like, and more that's successful, crazy. <laughs> and ultimately became very successful in Formula 2. His first race in that series was in 1964 at Aspen, but his first win came while racing at the famous Crystal Palace circuit, where he beat Graham Hill. Graham Hill. Now, it wasn't uncommon for drivers to race in multiple disciplines at this time, and Rint was no different. In 1965, he made his second visit to Le Mans where his team won, driving a Ferrari 250 LM that he thought was so uncompetitive, he was hoping that the thing would break down soon into the race so he and his teammates could then get paid and go home. Hey, and it almost it'd happened. Be like that. At one point, <laughs> the car like lost that. six of its 12 cylinders, but they managed to get it going again, and Rint drove through the night getting back up to third while teammate Maston Gregory finished the race. Master Gregory. It was also in 1965 that Rint had signed for the Cooper team, having joined from driving loaned Brabham's lease to him by the Rob Walker Racing Team. But it wasn't a particularly successful season, given he only scored four points and finished 13th in the championship Ooh, due nice. to the car not being fast enough, as well as being unreliable. In 1966, things improved, finishing second at the absolutely carnage-laden Belgian Grand Prix and finishing third overall come the end. How many of you guys can actually name all of these drivers. The only ones I know is Brabham, Surtees, Rent, De uh, Denny Homme, Homme, Graham Hill, Jim Clark, Jackie Stewart, and Bruce McLaren. So that's that's what I guess that's that's what half. But look at the retirements, bro. Look how many retirements there was back in the day. Jeez, forty five points. I mean, obviously, I think if you won, you get like a point. But the retirements back then were crazy. <laughs> Nobody was finishing races back then. But in 1967, he'd only finished two races, and both of those were a fourth place that meant another 13th place in the championship. So for 1968, he got himself a full-on Brabham factory drive, but the Ford DFV engine was now in use by most of the grid, and Brabham was still using Repco V8s that just weren't as good. And reliability was once again his enemy, as he would only finish two races all season. The first race of that season was in South Africa on New Year's Day, and Rimp was on the podium for Jim Clark's final ever World Championship win. Mm. Now Clark would be killed at Hockenheim three months later, and Rimp was already back in Jackie Stewart's campaign of better safety in the sport, as well as also being a friend of Clark's. 
Now, being a German speaker, Rint would deal with the infamous 14-mile Nürburgring circuit to mm. demand better safety. Mm. And since he, Stuart and Joe Bonnier were all Swiss residents and the leaders of this campaign, the press and the drivers who thought that the campaign was useless, such as Jackie Ix, called the three of them the Geneva Convention. The At the Geneva same time, Convention. his popularity in Austria led to two racetracks being built. One was the Osterreich Ring, which we now know as the Red Bull Ring. Ah. So moving into 1969, Rint joined Lotus, but was initially uncomfortable with the move given that it was a Lotus Formula 2 car that his friend Clark had been killed in. Mm. And in total, a Lotus had been involved in 31 accidents over the last two Jesus seasons, Christ. with his teammate Graham Hill being involved in nine of them just by himself. Yeah, I I wouldn't race a single car of theirs unless they fix it. I'm not, no, I'm not finna, no, I'm not finna do that, no. A Formula 2 car and Formula 1 after my friend Jim Clark just passed away. Plus you guys have been in multiple, multiple accidents with this car. Uh, no, I'm, I'm real hesitant. But it wasn't Rint that put real together hesitant. the deal. It was his manager, Bernie Eccleston. Uh, and Bernie knew that while Lotus cars were notoriously fragile, when they worked, Rint was certain to be world champion. Brabham would have been safer, but Lotus would achieve the life goal. Keyword win. Win. There's a documentary you can buy on iTunes, and I think it's also on Amazon and other on-demand video services called One Life on the Limit. It's a fantastic documentary. It came out in about 2012 or 2013 or so, and it details the safety improvements from sort of like the late 1960s all the way up until 2012, 2013, when it was released. And it's narrated by Michael Fassbender, and it's a really good documentary. I've watched it so many times while doing videos like this. But in I that documentary, Max Mosley is talking about the paradox of a racing driver. He said something along the lines of, if you present a racing driver with two identical cars and tell them that, right, this one is perfectly safe, but this one, if you crash it, you'll have a 70% chance of being killed. The driver will take the safer option. Right. But if you then tell him that the dangerous one is about half a second a lap quicker, the driver is going to go, sod the safe one. Yeah. I want the quick one. Facts. Facts. And safety concerns really started in this season when Rint and Hill were involved in a smash at the Spanish Grand Prix. Hill walked away from his, but Rint had a broken nose and a Marshall lost an eye. And then after the race, Rint wrote a letter to his boss, Colin Chapman, a letter that I only saw last night, courtesy of Matt Bishop on Twitter. And in that letter, Rint said, Dear Colin, I've just got back to Geneva and I'm going to have a second opinion on the state of my head tomorrow. Personally, I feel very weak and ill. I still have to lay down most of the day. After seeing the new doctor and hearing his opinion, we can make a final decision on Monaco and Indy. Mm. I got hold of this incredible picture which pretty much explains the accident. I didn't know it could fly that high. Robin Hurd apparently saw the wing go but couldn't see the accident as it happened around the corner. Now to the situation, Colin. I've been racing in Formula 1 for five years and I've only made one mistake <laughs> where I rammed Chris Amon at Claremont Ferrand. And I had one accident due to gearbox failure, otherwise I managed to stay out of trouble. This situation changed rapidly since I joined your team. Levin and Eiffel Race F2 Wishbones, and now Barcelona. Mm. Honestly, your cars are so quick that we would still be competitive with a few extra pounds used to make the weaker parts stronger. On top of that, I think you ought to spend some time checking what your different employees are doing. I'm sure the Wishbones on the F2 car would have looked different. Please give my suggestions some thought. I can only drive a car in which I have some confidence, and I feel the point of no confidence mm. is quite near. Mm. Kind regards, Jochen. Jochen. That letter being dated the 9th of May, 1969. That's very interesting. Very interesting. But publicly, though, Rint was a little less calm. On Austrian TV, he said that he blamed Chapman outright for the accident because Chapman had allowed those wings to break through him, ordering them to be as light as possible. And he also said that dealing with Chapman was downright impossible. When asked if he trusted Lotus at this point, Rint said that he'd never trusted Lotus and the relationship with Chapman was purely business. Jeez. But that year, Rint was the only person Jeez. who could get close to Jackie Stewart, being let down by typical Lotus fragility. But at the Italian Grand Prix that year, Stewart, Rint and Jean-Pierre Beltoise would be involved in the closest ever F1 finish as Stewart won the race by just eight hundredths of a second, with only another tenth or so back to Bruce McLaren in fourth. At Watkins Glen, though, he'd finally become a race winner, but his teammate Graham Hill was involved in an... Um, well, let's just call it a career-ending smash because Graham was never the same afterwards. Damn, what happened? 
But Hill managed to bounce back for 1970, driving for another team, and Rint became the de facto number one at Lotus. Lotus had decided to upgrade the car into what became the Lotus 72, innovative in that instead of the single radiator at the front of the car as had been customary for so long, it was the first to have two smaller radiators in the sides of the car. Yep, it was the first car to have side pods. Mm. So, but it wasn't particularly good. It retired from its first outing at the Spanish Grand Prix, so it meant that Rint had to use a Lotus 49 for Monaco, which didn't particularly work on the 1970 spec tyres that were being used at that point. But despite this, and despite starting 8th on the grid, he managed to claw his way up to 2nd, and then managed to overtake Jack Brabham on the final corner of the final lap to take victory. The next race was in Belgium, and he retired from that, but at Zandvoort, he got the 72 back, it was fixed, it was competitive, and it was the fastest thing on four wheels. And he went on to win that race at Zandvoort. Mm. But this is the race where Piers Courage, another friend, died in a car fire. Jeez. Now, this isn't the accident where David Purley stopped and got out of his car to help while the marshals stood around there doing nothing. Oh, no, that's not that was weird. a very similar accident three years later. But needless to say, after the Piers Courage accident, Jochen told his wife Nina that should he win the F1 World Championship, he'd retire from racing. Just three weeks earlier, Bruce McLaren had been testing at Goodwood and was killed there. Jeez. It was the third friend that Rint had lost to racing and the sixth F1 driver lost in the period 1967 to 1970. You know like, how like, draining that is to like... You're losing your racing, like, your racing counterpart to like, your racing friends. Like, it just seemed like it's just left and right. Like I said, we, we know about how bad it was back then in terms of, like, the safety and, like, how the car, you know, like, how just, like, the cars were and, like, F1 in general in regards to, like, their safety measurements. But still, though, like, if you're losing somebody left and right, that, that drains me. So I I, don't, I can't really blame Jochen for, like, wanting to retire after he won it because, to be honest, I mean, you can't really be mad about that because I, I, I will probably do it. I mean, but that's, you know, some people are just different because that competitive nature, like you want to keep competing, stuff like that. But like, if you're seeing, you know, <coughs> you know, <coughs> people dying left and right. <coughs> he was at the that, end of his tether with Chapman as well. While the Lotus 72 <laughs> was the you. fastest thing on four wheels, his steering seized at Sherrard in France while practicing for the French Grand Prix. When he finally got back to the garage, he confronted Chapman and said, if this happens again and I survive, I'm going to kill the lot of you. He then won at Hockenheim, which was replacing the Nürburgring after Rint had personally gone there to demand safety improvements. When the Nürburgring tried to call the GPDA's bluff, Jack Brabham is said to have stood up in the meeting they were having and said, well that settles it then, we're not going, mm. and they went to Hockenheim instead. He could have been champion at home in Austria, but his Lotus went full Lotus. Ah, oh, jeez. Of so moving on into Monza 1970, and this just shows the absolute insanity of the engineering lengths they go to back in those days. Now today, when they go to a fast track, whether that's somewhere like Baku or Monza or something like that, they run as little wing as possible for the straight line speed, but run just enough so that when the car needs to turn in, it will. Right. Now back in 1970 and also in 68 and 69 when the wings started to appear, they just took them off. Mm. With no wings and adjusted gear ratios, it's reckoned that Rint was hitting over 200 miles an hour, yeah, with the Ferraris able to extract a tiny bit more from their flat 12s. Maybe nudging 210 or 215, but what's That's claimed crazy. and what was actually achieved is quite difficult to find out. Now, 200 miles an hour in a modern car is done at, well, most tracks, even without right. the DRS system open, then? and they'll do it without breaking a sweat. In 1970, though, they might as well have been on Captain Kirk's Enterprise because it must have been like doing Warp 10. Golly. Now, Jochen seemed to be okay with this setup, and by setup I mean just taking the wings off, but his teammate John Miles was completely against it, saying that the car was completely undrivable and it was the only time he'd ever been truly scared in a racing car. Mm. Now, the Lotus 49 would have been fine to go about with no wings on because it was designed in 1967 when they weren't running wings, so it was... You know, designed for it. The 72, on the other hand, was designed with wings in mind and needed it for the full aero balance. So really, Rint and all the other drivers that were taking their wings off were essentially playing with fire. Yeah, honestly. It also has to be noted here that in honestly. 1970, Monza had no chicanes. 
But then in practice heading towards Parabolica at nearly 200 miles an hour, the brakes failed. By the time Bernie, Eccleston and Rint's engineer could get to the site of the crash, Rint was already dead. By the time Stuart got there, the last rites had been given to Rint by a local priest. Now this is the gory part, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this because this is the reality of racing in this period. Now Rint, like others, took shortcuts in terms of wearing seatbelts. Some drivers risked not wearing them at all up to a point because it was better to be ejected and take a chance with broken bones or paralysis than be burned alive, because that's what these things were. 190 mile an hour Molotov cocktails. Jeez. Now Rint was at the time only wearing four points of his five point safety belt so he wasn't using the crotch straps. He might have also been wearing them slightly loose as well so that if he did crash and the car started to burn he could just get out and run away from the burning wreckage. And you now Dale Earnhardt ran his slightly loose as well in NASCAR for more comfort reasons than anything else before his fatal crash in the Daytona 500 in 2001. But the problem is, when Rint slammed into that barrier at high speed, he slipped in his seat, and the seatbelt buckle on one of the shoulder straps slit his throat. Oh my god. It's all a horrific case of foreshadowing. The letter to Chapman, the threats to Chapman, and also saying in a TV interview that he'd be lucky to reach 40. As fate would have it, he wouldn't even reach 30. He was 28 at the time of his death. And after the crash, it meant that Jackie Ix was now in a position to capitalise, but the results that Ix did or didn't get in this case meant that Rint had scored enough points to become F1's first, and hopefully only, posthumous world champion. And that's a record that you hope never gets mashed yeah, or beaten. Honestly. Now there's a quiz show on TV over here called Pointless. The object of the game is to score as low as possible. So for instance, let's say the question was, name any of the ten Canadian provinces, and you said, Ontario. They then find out how many of the 100 people in the studio audience said Ontario, and it would score pretty high, 62 or something like that. But if you said Prince Edward Island, which is a more obscure answer, you'd probably win the round with 22, 4, 8, 16, whatever it may be. Mm. Now sometimes they do have Formula 1 related questions, and that's one of the few categories where I can actually clean up, but as the Guardian reports... It's... I've, I, I, like I said, I, I spoke about this during, like, the, the, like, the horrific crashes that we did last week, and, like, if the drivers can see how dangerous a car is, you know, I get it, you know, like you said, like, you know, if you want to choose a car that's faster, a car that's safer, you're probably going to choose the car even though it's a split second faster, because that split second can lead you to a win or a championship or whatever. But that, but at the same time, yeah, you take that, but it's still a higher chance of you, you know, a fortune passing away. In this situation, they took off the wings for a car that you shouldn't, and you shouldn't really take off the wings for. And unfortunately, we saw what happened with Yawk and Rent. Very, very unfortunately, but it just sucks. Just. Like I said, it's just so much just for what I was putting together this video. Happen. Whenever they do ask a Formula One related question, it's usually name a Grand Prix winner or name a world champion or name Lewis a Monaco Hamilton. Grand Prix winner. So they get varying Senna. levels of specificness <laughs> to try and trip the contestants up. And they found that when they do ask these questions, the four or five lowest scoring answers that you get, some of them being pointless, which means that nobody in the audience got mm. it and it adds £250 to the jackpot if you find one of those answers. Oh, that's cool. Those drivers are usually Jano Trulli, Juan Pablo Montoya, Olivier Panis, Pastor Maldonado, and Jochen Rint. Mm. And in a way, it's sad that Rint is known as the world champion who was killed before he became world champion. He was one of the few people at that time to say enough was enough in terms of drivers being killed. Right. He wrote a letter to his well, boss asking was, for know. the car to be made safe, and if the story is to be believed, threatened his boss to make the car safe. Mm. He was an early member of the GPDA, the organisation we saw sitting around in Jeddah a month or so ago demanding guarantees of safety. Without Rint and the rest of those guys, that meeting would probably have never happened. Yeah. So then, a look at Jochen Rint's tragic World Championship win the day after he would have turned 80 years old. If you've learned something new from this video today, then be sure to give the video a like. And if you do want to see more of this stuff and you're not already, get subscribed and also get that bell on. So never it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Again, shout out to Aiden. Very, very great video. Very informative video. But again, it just shows how 
much drivers back then it was starting to take into effect of how of safety stuff like that and wanting to play it safe just for you know it to not fully do it and don't get me wrong they were doing some safe stuff back then i think you know like what the 70s and 80s they were starting to increase the safety stuff like that but we kind of know about how deadly the late 60s early 70s period was in terms of death stuff like that so uh but like i said we came a long way we came a long way We've had some scary incident, obviously Grosjean's, uh, Guan Yu, and uh, you know we just we don't want to see you know anybody pass away, especially in a sport that they are doing that they love, especially for us fans as well. We want to see the drivers go out there competing, you know, racing hard, but you know at the same time, you know, we know unfortunately that you just never know what could happen in an F1 race. But a uh, very, very important video. Very, very good video. As always, if you guys did enjoy it, like I said, excuse me for my sickness. Don't forget to like the video and sub as well. Take care. Stay amazing. Hopefully, I, I did not get you guys sick through here. Be sick through here. Uh, appreciate it. I'll see you guys soon. Peace.